Hi, I'm Chris Wade. I'm a consultant speech language therapist, and this is a webinar called So You Want to Be a Speech Therapist or Speech Language Therapist, Liberate and Interchangeable. Um, and this is a webinar aimed at individuals that are looking to get into speech therapy, so get onto the speech therapy course and to qualify as a speech language therapist. In all the webinars that I've recorded, I tend to do this twice. I tend to introduce myself twice. And I guess this comes from what Dale Carnegie says. And he says that you need to introduce, introduce your, say your name twice or say your name so that people remember it. And um, so my name's Chris, Chris Wade. Um, and I think that's important when you're reflecting, when you go into interviews, etc. make sure you make people remember your name. Um, I con I'm a consultant speech language therapist and I'm based in Caerphilly, South Wales. So what makes me qualified to, to run this webinar about becoming a speech therapist? So after I did my degree in linguistics, I did a BA in linguistics, and then I went straight into a degree, so a BSc in clinical language sciences, um, which was the speech therapy course, uh, so the, the, the course name for the speech and language therapy course that I did. <clears throat> At the time it was at Leeds Met University, and I qualified in 2007. So since qualifying, I've worked across. So I applied for my first job. Um, so it was a time when there were very few jobs out there. So in 2007, um, I think it was around about the time of the, just before the recession, um, there weren't many jobs out there. On the NHS.jobs website, there were five jobs available for speech therapists across the UK. I'm living up north and I'm a northerner at the time. Um, and it's really important, that was really important for me for some reason. And I applied for a job in a place called Redbridge. And I thought Redbridge was in Liverpool. I didn't do that much research. I went for one of the five jobs available and I got one of the jobs. Turns out Redbridge is in South, not South, in North East London. Um, so I spent the first 18 months living in Redbridge, working as a paediatric speech therapist in mainstream schools uh, and in, in an autism base and an autism specialist school and also living in the nurses accommodation that came with the job. Um, and then whilst working in the NHS, I um, started working with adults with learning disabilities. So I moved up a position to the next banding, worked with paediatrics and adults with learning disabilities and then trained in what we call dysphagia, which I'll cover in a bit. Um, I then moved into a more specialist role um, in South London, and that was a, uh, at the time it was a locum position. So the locums are where you, you are not contracted as you are in terms of a permanent contract, but it's more of a temporary contract. And I took a locum contract on service development in a South London NHS trust, and then took a, a more senior position. So now I'm moving up to the next band um, in a North West London NHS trust, where I developed a autism diagnostic pathway alongside a clinical psychologist who we were joint leads and it was an, a diagnostic intervention and training pathway and then we delivered that pathway for about 18 months. Um, during all of this time, um, I think after about two years of qualifying, I started working independently and kind of gathering independent experience. Um, and then I met a, a lady from Wales and moved to Wales um, and moved to Caerphilly or moved to Cardiff, then to Caerphilly, but maintained my links to London because my private practice was flourishing in London and I do the, the back and forth. And whilst I've been in, in Wales, I've worked for two NHS trusts. I've been independently, fully independently for about five years. But I do dip in and out of doing NHS work. So I think it's very important. The NHS trained me and it's important that I use the skills and experience and the extra training I've, pro I've been provided by, by the NHS and also what I've, been, what I've invested in myself and give back to the NHS where possible. Um, I've also worked for local authorities and um, so your local councils and uh, for specialist schools um, who are independent. Um, in addition to that, I've got quite extensive international work. I've worked uh, so typically for kind of high net worth families in, in Russia, um, in India. I've worked across the Middle East, so uh, Abu Dhabi, Sharjah, Ab Dubai. Uh, I've worked in Qatar. I've done some stuff in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, but not physically visited the, um, the country. Um, I've worked in Nigeria. I've worked in Egypt and also in Geneva. So I've done quite a lot of extensive, well, I'd say extensive international work, but there tends to be project work. 
so kind of one or two weeks here and there um, and as part of that I'm doing assessment of children I'm doing parent and nanny training and I'm also doing school training and working in embedding the work that I'm doing at home into the school setting so the title speech and language therapist I some people call them speech therapists some call them speech language therapists and um, the two titles are legally protected in the UK which basically means you can't call yourself a speech therapist or a speech and language therapist unless you are qualified to do so. And also, you must be registered with the Healthcare Professions Council in order to practice. Um, and that's kind of the, the, reg, the statutory body. We have to be members of the HCPC. Um, in addition to that, we should be members of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. And there's lots of student, students, student, speech, student speech and language therapists also become members of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists and the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, the RCSLT, because it's such a long word, such a long bunch of words to say, the RCSLT provide um, insurance, they provide lots and lots of clinical guidance and, and um, training, they provide um, a monthly bulletin magazine that gets sent to you with lots of information from fellow therapists and therapists um, internationally, um, new research. There, there's also the, um, as a journal, so a, an academic journal that comes with the magazine. Um, in addition to that, they run annual conferences um, on um, for students, but also for, for fully, fully qualified clinicians. So it's, it's good to be a member of the RCSLT. In addition, in addition to the RCSLT and the HCPC, there are other organisations you can join. Some people may join um, ASLTIP, so that's the Association of Speech and Language Therapists in Independent Practice. Um, and they're, they're typically for independent, obviously independent therapists tend to join there, and that's a database of speech and language therapists working in independent practice in the UK. Um, and there are other organisations that speech therapists may join, but your top two, one that you have to join is HCPC. HCPC. So once you qualify, you then have to apply to become a member of the HCPC before you can actually start working. And your second one is your Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. So our professional title, speech and language therapist, kind of does what it says in the tin. It's so we're experts in speech, language and communication skills. One thing that people aren't aware of is there's a specialism within speech therapy, uh, which is the domain of the speech therapist, which is eating and drinking skills, which is called dysphagia. Um, I'm qualified in dysphagia, but I don't practice in dysphagia because I stepped out of it because I wasn't getting enough experience when whilst working independently. Um, but so you've got speech language therapists that are experts in speech, language and communication skills and in eating and drinking skills where they've done the additional qualification. So as speech therapists, as part of our HCPC statutory guidelines, we have to maintain continued professional development and record this and record what we've learned from the CPD. Um, and we have a set number of hours each year that we have to do um, CPD. And CPD can include the obvious attending of formal training, such as I've got a webinar on report writing, I've got another one on uh, giving evidence as an expert witness, but there's lots of formal training you can attend. It includes informal training where the on the job training, um, which lots of trusts and lots of teams will do because it's expensive to send everybody a particular training course. Um, a CPD includes discussing tri tricky clinical cases with your supervisor and doing additional research around those cases, attending internal training, such as your internal training within a team um, and reading articles. But the key, key, the key important thing isn't to just attend training courses. It's so easy just to attend a training course in the plethora of, active, of, um, of clinical areas in speech therapy. The most important thing is how do I apply this to my clinical practice? How do I reflect on what I have learnt and apply this to the cases that it's relevant to? As I've already said, I did the BSc at Leeds Met University, which is now Leeds Beckett University. That course itself was a three year course. So it's three year BSc. Um, there's, also a, there's also four year BSCs out there and a two year MSc if you already have a degree. I chose not to do the MSc because 
in order to get onto the MSC at the time, and I don't know if things have changed, but in order to get on the MSC, you had to know the grade of your current degree or the degree, degree you've done, which to me meant I'd have to take time out. And in a sense, I'd be qualifying or graduating in linguistics in 2004. And I thought, wait a second, if I qualify, not qualify, if I graduate in linguistics, the first thing I'm going to do is get pulled into a career in, in any other industry. And I really, really, really want to do speech therapy because I've been to a speech therapy um, talk by a speech therapist who was over enthusiastic, a little bit like me, who absolutely loved their job. And I thought, I sat there during this lecture and I thought, wait a second, I don't know any adult who knows a job who loves the job that they do and is so passionate about what they do and the only people that I do are now I know lots because I'm a speech therapist and there are lots of people who love their jobs but I didn't know anybody that loved their job and therefore I thought if I take time out to get onto the MSc which would equal three years eventually because you've taken a year out and then two years to do the course um I just didn't think I'd, I would take the year out and then come back so I thought I'll just do the BSc. So I did the three year BSc. The course itself is a mixture of lectures with self-directed learning and placement hours, depending on which year you're in and which part, which which cohort in terms of where, where you are in the year. And the Royal College of Speech Language Therapists sets a minimum number of clinical hours in order for you to qualify. And that's all kind of part of the kind of the course, um, how the course is run. Uh, so you do, you have a two year MSc and you have a three or four year BSc. They're your two major routes. There is talk at the moment and they're developing a speech and language therapy apprenticeship. Um, but that hasn't, the information, the full information about how that's going to work hasn't yet been released. But it is important to think about that is going to be something that is there in the future. So I've done two degrees. I've done a BA and a BSc. Um, the BA in linguistics um, was, I don't know how I ended up getting doing a BA in linguistics, but I, I wanted to go to university and I did this particular course. And I went to, at the time, the top university for linguistics. And my total lecture time per week um, during, the, during the second and third year was about five hours. I think it dropped from five hours to four years from year, year two to year three. So physical time on campus, was around about four hours of direct lectures. Um, There's none of the online stuff, online lectures. So it was direct lectures for about four to five hours. In addition to that, it was self-directed learning, lots and lots of um, kind of group work, but also lots of um, essays, so constant essays. But in comparison, my linguistics degree. So whilst I did my linguistics degree, I was also social secretary of the whole of my the whole college of my university because Lancaster is a college university. So I was social secretary. So it was my job to take people on social events, and I was able to do that. So I'd do my BA in linguistics, be the social secretary of the college, but also work a part time job. Um, and when I look back, my linguistics degree, whilst technically it was hard, it was a doddle in comparison to my speech and language therapy degree, so my clinical language sciences degree. Speech therapy courses are very, very different to typical degrees. It's like a vocational course. And to be honest, it's more of a full time job plus admin on top. <clears throat> There's a, it's you've got you're in. Um, the, the, it's heavy hours in terms of lectures, it's heavy hours in terms of self-directed learning, it's heavy hours in terms of placement, and it's also heavy hours in terms of kind of wrapping it all up and being reflective. But believe me, it is worth every single second. So the speech and language therapy course itself, no matter if you do the MSc or the BSc, they cover the same content. Um, here's a list of the things that they cover. I don't think it's a fully extensive list, but it's a very, very broad list in terms of development. So we've got early language development. So you learn about theories of early language development. Um, you've got lectures on anatomy and physiology, which you'll typically be focusing on the head and neck, but you need to have a good understanding of everything. And you'll typically do your anatomy and physiology lectures with physios and there may be some practical elements as well depending on which university you go to. Linguistics is another part of the speech and language therapy course which as a linguistics graduate I was a little bit cocky thinking this is going to be an absolute doddle. Linguistics when you're doing speech therapy 
is still hard, even though I had a two one in linguistics. And my friend who did the did linguistics course with me at Lancaster and then came to Leeds and did the speech therapy course um, alongside each other. He got a first in linguistics and he still found the linguistics element in speech therapy difficult too. Not as difficult as I did. Um, then you've got phonetics and phonology. Um, I'm not going to describe what all these things are. I want you to, I want you to do a bit of self-directed learning as well. But phonetics and phonology is about speech production. Um, we covered this in linguistics, but again, this is the practical application as well. So this is really important when you, when you all these areas that like you're looking at this list, these are all important in terms of the job of a speech therapist. So it's important that they have to teach it and they have to teach it in depth and then you have to then apply it to the role as well. There's, there's sections of the course that look at social linguistics. So that's the use of language in different cultures, the, the use of language from now, since uh, from olden days up to now. Um, there's, there's a heavy, um, there's heavy kind of um, part of the course on psychology on um, looking at statistics, on being able to do studies, being able to read papers, being able to question things, um, and then psychological theories. Um, because you've learned about early language development, you also need to understand a typical language development. So this is what you'd see as um, not typical language development. So you need to know what's typical before you know what's atypical. Um, and then again, like I said right at the start, it's the practical application of all of the above to your clinical practice. In addition to what was on the previous slide, it's important to also state that there's a placement aspect or a placement element throughout the course. So your to begin with, your placement will be in typical settings such as um, a typical school or a nursery setting and it's an observational placement where you immerse yourself and you see typical language development. There'll also be an element of going to a nursing home for example and seeing the, the geriatric, geriatric population and see how communication is uh, in that population and what the, the, kind, of, the, the kind of typical development is in, it's in that area. Um, now we're going to look at how to get on the course and it's important to constantly think that all the skills that you have from whatever job you have done are transferable. If, you th if I told you the jobs that I've done up to now, so I was a waiter, um, I was a, a, a kind of a cleaner in a restaurant, so um, I have been a, fla a flair bartender, I used to edit the football show for Bradford City at a local radio stations. I hate football, but I still did it. Um, I, I've worked in five star hotels, um, I've worked as a mascot um, for, for a local radio station. I was an eight foot high bright blue pigeon. Um, as part of that role, the perk was I had to be the one that went to the airport to pick up the acts. Um, so I met, at the time I met a lot of kind of top five acts, um, bands and kind of people that are still around now. Um, so I, I was one that was, I was a runner, so I had to go and collect them from the airport and drive them back in the cries or whatever. Um, and then make sure everything was okay, make sure that we got everything on their rider list, etc. cetera. Um, I've also been, I've also worked as a, in an estate agency. Um, so there's, and so all of these jobs that I've done, there's aspects from all of them where the skills are transferable. Um, and then it's really important to think right now, what is my experience? So as, as a person that wants to get onto a speech therapy course, what have I done so far? What have I done with my life so far? What jobs have I done? Um, and how have the things that I've done so far prepared me to get to where I am? And the key thing to remember is speech therapy is primarily about communication. We've got the dysphagia element, but it's primarily about communication. And therefore, in all of the rules you've done so far, there'll be an element of communication. So think about that. Think about whether there's been areas where you've had to do some work, some customer service aspects. Think about where you've had to been able, um, been able to work with children or work with adults. Uh, but remember that all the skills that you've learned so far are transferable. The other aspect of the course that's, that, that is kind of a requirement to get onto the, to, in order to, to apply, there's a question on every single university application form, and that's, have you observed a speech therapist? We know how difficult this is. We know to get into an NHS team, and um, there's often a, a long waiting list, but there's also 
there's um, there's now a need for DBS checks, which used to be criminal record checks for people um, sometimes in order for them to observe a speech therapist. Private practice is a little bit more flexible in terms of being, uh, allowing people to observe them. But again, there is still a need for the DBS. Um, seek opportunities where you can, where there may be, they may be accessing speech therapists. So most schools will have experience with speech therapists. So seek opportunities at schools, opportunities within nurseries, at care homes. It's difficult to get into hospitals. Um, and therefore that's a bit that you'll struggle with. But so think outside the box, think where could a speech therapist be? Um, find out, Google your local speech therapy team and contact them direct and see if there is a possibility you can spend time with somebody or at least have someone answer some questions. I've worked in private practice for years and I've coached lots and lots and lots of people, um, typically family friends, but lots of strangers to get onto the course and they've spent a day with me or we've had a Skype or whatever platform you use and they've gone through questions that they have about the course and also coach them in terms of how to apply, what needs to be in the personal statement and the sort of questions that you might be asked to interview. So getting onto a speech and therapy BSc or MSc is very competitive. When I got on one in 2004, I don't know how I managed it. Um, I attended an interview because most universities interview um, and the interview was very, very difficult for me. Um, I was very good at interviews, but it was a very challenging interview because they have to really separate what they say. You separate the wheat from the chaff. They need to make sure that the person that they uh, is get, that gets through interview and is offered a, a place based on a on set criteria and um, is able to commit to get through this very difficult course and therefore most interviews most universities do interview so be a one-to-one -one interview with you either you and a clinician and um, so i've done interviews where it's me as a clinician and an academic so a speech therapist but also someone who is uh, who works in the works university um, and and we will will ask kind of questions that relate to our we'll ask questions that in a sense have a slight turn in terms of experiential from my perspective and academic from the other um, in addition to that you might be expected to do some individual written or analysis work you might be asked, expected to so we were expected to listen to a um, watch a video and write down everything that was said in that video so to transcribe what was said um, there might be other tasks as well and there's typically a group activity to look at how well you fit in within a group speech therapists when they graduate work as part of typically work as part of multidisciplinary teams um, in schools we work with teachers we work with parents we work with senko so the special educational needs coordinators we'll work with educational psychologists and clinical psychologists with occupational therapists with physios with school nurses the list is endless so we have to be able to work as part of a group but you also have to be able to hold your own um, and and group activities i tell the universities a lot about the individual and the skill set that they have and the potential that they have. Next, I'm going to talk about kind of if you got through the course, hooray, you've graduated, you've got your HCPC kind of um, you're registered with the HCPC. So I'm going to talk about kind of what comes after that and kind of where to look for opportunities and the types of roles that you will have as a speech and language therapist. So this slide changes or has has changed over the kind of past 10 years um, or so. Um, your biggest employer of speech therapist is the NHS still uh, within the UK. Um, and in addition to that, things are starting to change where what used to happen is the um, local schools would have a what we call an agreement or a service level agreement uh, with the NHS to, to buy in speech therapy for their schools. Um, schools have now started to trade and look at other avenues to access speech therapy and therefore you've got local authorities that employ speech therapists, you've got private hospitals, you've got um, schools and nursing homes that directly employ speech therapists so they've got them as salaried employees, um, you've got the third sector that employs us but also you've got independent practice and in the last kind of 
10 years independent practice has really boomed in, in the UK um, it's, it's the same across I mean across the world independent independent speech therapy practices are big um, I had an independent practice I had 37 full-time speech therapists we had about 90 contracts across within the M25 so I owned a very large independent practice and the potential for that practice was to keep doubling it was we could have got bigger and bigger and bigger um, I sold the practice on to a large healthcare kind of conglomerate um, but what I'm trying to say is the employers of speech therapists when I qualified was very much NHS or NHS and now it is a much wider and varied kind of um, kind of employment routes for speech therapists both in the UK and internationally so now I'm going to talk about the different types of settings you could work in as a speech therapist. So with adults, you could work across the hospital. There's lots of different departments and specialisms within hospitals where a speech therapist has a role, um, especially in acute care. Um, speech therapists have had a kind of a significant role around COVID-19 and the management of eating and drinking um, and also the management of communication so there's a big role for speech therapists in hospitals um, in addition to that there's uh, there's a significant role for speech therapists in care homes when we think about um, individuals with kind of eating and drink, drinking difficulties but also individuals with dementia and um, speech therapists also work in community clinics where they might work with adults with learning disabilities and might work as an outreach um, clinician um, for people who've had strokes for example and um, speech therapists will also adult speech therapists may also visit homes or do online work um, in addition to that uh, an area that's kind of developing more and more is speech therapists working in prisons with adults with literacy or language difficulties um, that had previously been un unidentified and there's also and speech therapists also work in the court system as, as advocates um, and um, and are often referred to are now growing is a growing area um, work alongside the police in order to in order to interview ind individuals who may or may not have committed a crime in order to especially when the individual has a particular diagnosis within paediatrics which is more my experience uh, we can work with nurses in schools we work in family homes in community clinics um, in young offenders uh, institutes but also in hospitals. So I've worked in um, secure mental health assessment units for adolescents aged 13 to 18. Um, and kind of, I guess what I'm saying is that there's lots of settings in which we can work, but I, one of the big things that I've missed out there is um, the community. So as a independent speech therapist, a lot of the work I do, I'll start at home, I'll do some work at school, and then I'll do some work in the community. So I might be seen going to a play center with a child with autism, or I might go to the, the cinema with a, a young um, adult that has a stammer. And again, it's looking at the practical application of what I'm doing, but there's lots of settings that I could be working in. As a UK trained speech and language therapist, you'll be considered to be, um, you'll, be high, well, you'll be highly regarded across the world in terms of your qualification. Um, when I worked in Harley Street, I had a small, I'd say tiny room in Harley Street where um, often families from the Middle East or Far East or from Africa would, would arrive at the top of the street and they would select their medical team and the and Harley Street was right next to the embassies. Um, so we had, I had to have families from across the world based on the fact that I was London based, but also based on the fact that I was UK trained. And because of that, I was invited, this is how I did international work, I was then invited out to do work and to train clinicians in other countries. Um, it's also important to think that UK, the, so the RCSLT, so the Royal College of Speech and Therapists, has agreements with other organisations, so they're equal bodies in other countries, where we may have to do additional qualifications or additional training or um, have our certificates certified, etc. But we can then physically move to other countries. I work a lot in other countries as a visiting professional, um, but in order for me to work in a place like the UAE, I have to do additional kind of an in additional interview, etc. But the, having a UK train, having been UK trained, puts me in a very kind of particularly special position. So in the UK in the NHS, we have what's known as the banding system and spine points, and you can move from what's say kind of a newly qualified would start as a band five, as a newly qualified speech therapist as a band five, but you can be a band five for several years, and you can move and you can move 
within the up through the spine point within a band and then to a gateway into the next band you'd have to interview for the next band um private practice typically follows this suit so that in order to be competitive as a private provider and, and recruit speech therapists um because speech therapists are again there there's there's a i don't know if there's still a national shortage but um it's difficult to find when i was recruiting speech therapists it could be very difficult at times to find a speech therapist um and therefore what private practice tends to do is it tends to follow suit with the nhs so when when the nhs um gets their pay increase um the private practice practitioners will typically get the same increase um there's obviously diff there'll also be slight differences here and there and then there's progression within a, an organization is obviously like any other role it's dependent on quite a few different factors so it could be down to the time you've been in that particular role or the level of specialism or what whether there's specific training required so when i needed to kind of specialize in autism and i needed to do my autism diagnostic training which is the ados or the a and the adi and I had to do specific training in, in intervention, which I did teach, um, and also training in dysphagia for working with children with eating and drinking difficulties. I moved up from um, a band five to six to seven. Um, in addition to that, the, as you as your career progresses, you'll move, you'll um, need clinical supervision throughout your career. However, as you move from a band, as you move from newly qualified through to maybe a, a higher band five or into a band six role, then you'll need to take on clinical supervision roles. There's lots of clinical supervision training available. Um, the Royal College of Speech Therapists advertises quite um, one core training, um, which is through a, a, another provider. Um, and in addition to that, you might be asked to lead in specific clinical areas. Um, and then finally, to in terms of that progression within a within an organization there'll be managerial roles and then as a managerial role in order to maintain your title as a speech and language service there's still the minimum number, number of hours that the royal college of speech therapist sets out in order for you to do as clinical practice to maintain your title so the course that you do either the bsc or the msc will look at both paediatric work and working with adults so i've put geriatrics um but it's adults so it's and essentially it's cradle to grave i hate that term it's cradle to grave so working with children who are tiny going all the way through to working with older adults and it's important to like i said right at the start that think about the transferable skills that you've got from other professional roles or other roles whatever those roles were you have the same aspect within speech therapy. So I moved from working with children with autism to adults with learning disabilities and adults with um, who'd had um, who'd had a, who'd had a stroke, for example. Um, and then I worked with at a pediatric cerebral palsy and then adult cerebral palsy. So there's, there's a lot of movement and transferable skills um, within speech therapy. So you don't have to choose on day one, you don't have to choose on day two. I'm on year 13 and I still don't have to choose if I wanna work with pediatrics or if I wanna work with an older population. Um, if I need to, if I wanted to work with an older population in the future, I may have to do some additional training around that, the particular needs and the particular approach to that population but there's nothing stopping me from working with that population i just have to be mindful whenever i'm thinking about who i'm the referrals i take on that i have the clinical expertise and then working within my remit and if i'm not I, i'll fall foul of the hcpc guidelines and therefore if i want to work with adults then i'd spend time volunteering or seeking supervision from someone who's a clinical specialist in this area so i can develop my skills I'm mindful that you've paid to attend this webinar and that whilst I've spent a lot of time putting the webinar together and delivering it, it's still your money and your time. You've invested a lot into attending this webinar. And therefore I wanna make sure that you're happy with what you have received. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, these are the different um, kind of platforms in which you can catch me on. Um, I've got four children um, and a wife and, and a little puppy, so I, I might not get back to you immediately, but I tend to get back to people within 24 hours. Um, do feel free to, to ask me for questions, give me, ask questions, ask for advice. Um, 
I, there's, there's something that I'm developing or in the pipeline called Speech Guardians, which um, is a platform for supporting students to get on the course, but also supporting students and mentoring students once they're on the course through to graduation then and beyond. In addition to that, there'll be there's, there's an, the, as, the main aspect of the site is to guide parents um, in delivering speech language therapy with their children. Um, so I've put the, the speech guardians information on there in terms of Twitter. You've got my Twitter email, my Twitter address for me and also the company. You've got my email address, my Instagram, Instagram address. Do feel free to contact me and let me know if you've got any questions or any comments. Uh, thank you so much for your time and take care. Thank you. Bye.